Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks everyone for joining um, our lunchtime uh, call today, this Thursday. Um, I am broadcasting from uh, lockdown L London, more specifically my own bedroom. And um, we have a fantastic um, panel um, and discussion build for you today. Um, just wanted to introduce myself first. I'm Mary Fitzgerald. I'm the editor in chief of Open Democracy. I think many of you are familiar with Open Democracy, but we're a global uh, nonprofit media organization. Um, our goal is to challenge power and inspire change. Uh, we're doing some in fantastic investigative reporting during coronavirus. Um, and if you want to know more about how uh, coronavirus uh, and, the, and the pandemic is affecting uh, democracy and human rights across the world, I'd highly encourage you to sign up to our new um, weekly bulletin service, which is opendemocracy.net forward slash Corona crackdown um, to get weekly bulletins about the way that this crisis is playing out for democracy and human rights all across the world. Thank you so much for joining. The first thing to say before I introduce the panelists is um, we want this conversation to involve you. So thanks to everyone who submitted uh, questions and comments ahead of time. We're going to try and address as many of them as we can. Um, if you're joining us on Zoom, um, if you have a question or a comment, you can click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen um, and type into the chat window. Um, if you're joining from Facebook, you can add your input in the Facebook chat and it will be fed back to me. Um, you'll find that your microphones are muted. That's so people can talk one at a time. We'll un unmute you if we um, want to bring you into direct conversation and um, all of your inputs and thoughts will be fed to me and I'll be trying to feed back as much of that as I can into the conversation. Um, final thing, just as a warning, uh, this is, um, this is rough and ready. Um, my kids are downstairs watching a film. We may be introduced, in, in, um, introduced to them at some point or interrupted by pets or um, by background noise, um, such as life under lockdown. So um, apologies in advance for any unscheduled interruptions and I hope you'll bear with us. Um, today we're joined by a fantastic panel. Um, first of all, Dr. Linda Yu, who's the economist um, and author of The Great Economist, How Their Ideas Can Help Us Today. We've got Paul Mason, um, journalist who's contributed many times to Open Democracy and also the author of Clear Bright Future, A Radical Defense of the Human Being. Um, and also by Laurie McFarlane, uh, Open Democracy's economics editor who wrote the um, excellent thoughtful piece, which is the provocation for this discussion today. Um, I assume uh, many of you will have read it, but um, the summary, uh, the headline of the piece is, a spectre is haunting the West, the spectre of authoritarian capitalism. Um, and uh, Laurie, uh, Laurie says, you know, from coronavirus to climate change, China is surging ahead of the US and its allies. Are we witnessing the slow death of liberal capitalism? Um, we've put the link to the piece in the chat. I'd highly encourage everyone to, to read it who hasn't already. Um, and so I'm gonna invite Laurie to kick off. Um, tell us just very briefly what, what your piece argues and also set, set the scene for us. Where, where was China before this crisis kicked off? Great, thanks Mary. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Carl Bildt, the Swedish, former Swedish Prime Minister, described the coronavirus pandemic unfolding as the first great crisis of uh, the post-American world. Now, he was mainly referring to, uh, I think, the disastrous response of President Trump's government to the crisis domestically and, and on the world stage as well. But I think that if we want to understand or unpick the implications of this current uh, crisis, in terms of what it might be for the global economy and the balance of power within it. I think it's really important that we look at this in a much broader, bigger picture context, both of China's rise on the one hand um, and of the, the, the challenges that are being faced by Western liberal capitalism uh, long before this crisis came along. Since around the, the, the 1980s, um, when China's opening up process began, there's existed a somewhat symbiotic relationship between China's booming economy on the one hand and prosperity on West, in the West on the other. Um, and this is in, in ways like being able to import cheap uh, consumer goods and also providing a, a pool of cheap labor for Western corporations uh, to, to exploit and to outsource operations to. In recent years, though, I think this is, um, we've seen a slight change in this. And, and this has come from the fact that Chinese companies have become more globally competitive, at least in some areas, higher up the value chain. And we see this in certain technologies. Huawei is, is, is probably the most prominent example of this. And we've also seen the Chinese government make clear its, its goal, uh, its ambition to achieve self-sufficiency or something close to it in some of the key major technologies of the future. And this was really setting alarm bells off both uh, in Washington 
and in Europe at long before this crisis came along. And there's fears starting to, to sort of build in some quarters that China's economic model could potentially, not necessarily now, but could potentially uh, be a, a sort of rival to Western liberal capitalism uh, and also to the technological supremacy uh, that's long underpinned that hegemony. And there's been various ways we've seen this manifest itself. Uh, Trump's trade war probably being the most prominent one, which from the beginning wasn't really uh, about trade. Uh, it was much more about trying to contain China's rise as a, as a rival economic power. But we've also seen this play out in Europe uh, in ways that I discuss in the, in the piece as well. Um, and so long before the, this crisis came along, there were these questions um, that people were being discussed about whether China's in many ways, momentous rise means we're seeing the end of what's been called the, the, the American century and whether we're seeing the rise of a, of a new Chinese century where China would replace the US as a dominant global power. Um, and certainly up until now, I think there was always good reason to be skeptical about this, at least as something being on the immediate horizon. But as I hope we'll come on to talk about in this discussion, um, I do think that the nature of the coronavirus crisis that's, that's unfolding has the potential to shift things in quite significant ways, not just for the balance of power uh, between the East and West, as it were, but also in terms of how our own economies here in places like the UK, Europe and elsewhere in the West uh, function on a day to day basis. Thank you, Laurie. And yes, I mean, a small example of that is um, Trump decided to, to withdraw um, funding for the World Health Organization and China's picking up the tab now, which has all kinds of implications. Um, uh, Linda, um, despite China's huge advances, which Laurie's uh, detailed um, in his piece, um, you've written about how, it's, how, Ch how China is still facing some very significant economic challenges. Is it really on course to be the world's next superpower? It's a great question. Um, I think, um, well, because I've just written this book on great economists, this quote from the great economist Galbraith always comes to mind when people ask about where an economy is headed. He said, economic forecasting exists to make astrology look respectable. And so <laughs> it is, you know, it is, uh, it is remarkable how China has lifted itself from being one of the poorest countries in the world to becoming a middle income country and the second biggest economy in the world. But the next bit phase in terms of the challenge, in terms of China becoming rich, that is considerable. I mean, that is something that only a handful of countries have managed to do in the post-war period. I think you do need an economic foundation, I think, to be a superpower. But there are other ways in which the Chinese influence, um, you can think of it maybe as an economic superpower. Um, you know, there are obviously sectors where China is so uh, dominant and China's, China as a market um, is quite important to a number of multinational companies like Apple. So in that sense, um, the kind of shift I would say more of a dispersion of economic weight. We do see that. I don't know that necessarily means it's the end of the American century, I think, but China is now a heavier pole. So sometimes if you think of the term multipolar, I think we're in a multipolar world economy. But of course, it's a big adjustment to go from a world in which um, the American dominant role is now being um, balanced uh, by a country with a very different uh, political system as, as well as parts of its economic system. Um, but regardless of where China heads to, even if it stumbles, which is very likely, I think we will see this continued tension um, because of this, as I say, dispersion of economic weight and then therefore economic power. And I agree with Laurie, fundamentally, the US-China trade tension is about power. It's only something about trade. Next time it'll be more about technology and then it'll be something else. But I think there is that clash um, that we will continue to see. Thank you very much, Linda. Um, Paul, you had uh, the distinct honour of being the only Western journalist to sing the Internationale in the Great Hall at the inauguration of Xi Jinping. <laughs> and you, there's actually a chapter in your book which is all about why we should reject the thoughts of Xi Jinping. So in the context of a discussion of, of China's relative power and influence, um, tell us what you were talking about in that chapter and yeah, what um, the broader kind of uh, re reflections. I, I mean, I should, I should say they were a bit surprised when I joined in in the Internationale at the 18th Congress, 
it was the, the, the moment where, where she was inaugurated. But actually, remember, at that point, we didn't know that the Xi Jinping project would be what it is. We, I assumed, many other people assumed, you would still have collective leadership, there would be fact, the, the factions would play out. Um, it's been remarkable what, what, what he's achieved. Um, I, the, the, the chapter in my book is called Reject the Thought of Xi Jinping, and, it, and it, it, what is not because I want to advocate the, any of the other thoughts that have been added to Chinese Marxism, you know, because I think it is all basically a combination of, of accountancy and, and Confucianism. I, I don't think it's Marxism at all. Uh, but I would say that, see, reacting to Lowy's article, um, I think I think that it's brilliant, but I, and I think the, what, some of the most perceptive stuff is that towards the end talking about the technological dominance. But I wanted to try and explain how I would frame China and its relationship to, to, to Western capitalism, because it most clearly is not. It, it is a form of capitalism. Whatever the CCP believes, it is a form of capitalism. And, and, and in fact, I see I have. I, it, it's not neoliberalism. It's not a part of it. It's not it, it doesn't it, it's no form of the neoliberal model. However, how I see China's rise since the opening up is like this. Western capitalism in, in kind of systems theory terms thrives on its openness. And by that, I don't just mean it's kind of internal openness, you know, the open market, etc. Uh, or the open society. It's it, it thrives on its ability to interact with with things that are outside it. And China has played the role of the other, the outside, for about the last 30 years. So it makes stuff which are imported uh, from outside. And it is a, an outside destination for Western foreign direct investment. And it is, you know, as increasingly a purchaser of US treasuries. Now, the question is, for me, that this wasn't predestined, the current role that China has assumed in the last four years. I see it very much as a reaction to Trump. Because, you know, when she comes to power uh, in 2012, and already was on the agenda before that, he, one, of his, one of his key words was the pursuit of a global community of common destiny. That's a through line from the moment Xi Jinping takes power right the way through to the, when he turns up at Davos and does the speech, that he wants, whatever else he wants, you know, however authoritarian uh, China is going to be under Xi Jinping, it, it wants to be part of a multilateral economic system. And it was when H.R. Uh, McMaster and Gary Cohn, almost immediately after Trump comes to power, they write this article that's saying, look, for us, the world is not a, com a global community of common destiny. It is a, an arena where nations, governmental actors and businesses engage and compete for advantage. And I, I think the Chinese uh, leadership saw that and said, right, OK, if that we already know that Trump, that, that, that Putin is engaged in that game. OK, now we are going to get engaged in that game. And that's when you get all the things Laurie lists, the, the technology strategy, the AI leadership strategy, which is uh, really important. The the move, so, so Chinese technology experts tell us, or business technology experts tell us, that it's not just that uh, the big tech companies in China have gained a state monopoly uh, license, as it were, on, on particular forms of tech, but the state has actually mapped out who shall have biotech monopoly, who shall have uh, g genome technology monopolies for the next 25 years. So Laurie is absolutely right that it, you know, as a model, um, it is increasingly going to be attractive, even though, as many American economists point out, it is pretty stagnant at the moment, the Chinese economy. The, it's a bit like the 1930s. Um, you know, the, the Soviet Union wasn't a, wasn't a great place in the 1930s. It just looked more dynamic than the West at the time. And I think we, in the next decade, we are going to see China D despite the, the, the downturn and the hit it's taken uh, this year, will look more dynamic because my great concern is that the Western economies are so overburdened with debt, so reliant on quantitative easing, and so un un undynamic in productivity terms 
that, that they will recover much more slowly and sluggishly than China will from this. Thank you, Paul. And that, that brings us quite neatly into, into the here and now. Um, and there are a number of questions uh, that people have, have asked about this moment and, and how this moment changes what was, what was already on course. Um, you know, everything from some, someone asked, will the corona emergency measures overcome people's reluctance against new forms of surveillance? Don't we already live under surveillance capitalism? And I wanted to, to um, talk a bit more about that in the context of China. Um, you know, do Laurie or Paul think liberal capitalism is better than authoritarian capitalism? You know, what are the alternatives? Um, and then there's some, a lot of questions around, you know, restricting freedom of thought, freedom of expression. Um, and, you know, is that going to be um, uh, ultimately something um, which impedes China's um, progress and, and, and influence in certain ways? Um, but um, I suppose the thing I want to, I'm conscious as well that, um, we have um, Yan Yang, who's um, the FT's uh, correspondent based in um, Beijing, who's, who's also dialing in. And, and Yan's and on this question of surveillance has written um, uh, some very uh, powerful and alarming <laughs> reports um, about um, your own brushes with intense surveillance. So I wanted to um, invite you in if you're there, Yan. Yeah, thank you. And I, I would love you to just sort of paint the picture for us of um, what surveillance was like in China before this crisis, and how this crisis is um, is 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 playing out when it, in, when it comes to that context. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, to us sitting here in Western liberal democracy, um, the ways in which the Chinese state is tracking and punishing citizens who don't comply um, with um, the law and the restrictions around COVID nineteen see, feels creepy and repressive. Um, and there's been a lot of debate about it. Um, but the reality is also a bit more complicated and, and how much control, go, going back to that um, control and monopoly point that Paul was making, how much con, um, control do they, do they really exert? So tell us about your own experience of this and, and, and how, um, how this issue is playing out during, during this time. Sure, thank you, Mary. And it's really nice to be connected to people back in the UK. I had been planning to come back to visit my family uh, who live near London a, a, about a month ago, but obviously had to cancel those plans and many more plans. Um, so as Mary said, I'm the FT's uh, Beijing correspondent, mostly covering technology. Um, I've been at the uh, sharp end of the surveillance state here. Um, facial recognition, to give one example, is advanced at the degree where a policeman can stop you on the street, um, as happened to me actually a few weeks ago, and scan your face using a smartphone app and then immediately find your passport details where you're registered to live, and all sorts of details about your visa history and so on um, within seconds. And coming from a country, the UK, which doesn't even have national ID cards, this is of course a very, a very big change. Um, I would say though that uh, a lot of the time um, there is a great overestimation of China's tech capabilities and capabilities um, in terms of governance at home because uh, the Chinese state is still very much a patchwork of different agencies, different levels of local and central government, often all competing for um, resources, competing for data and not sharing data with each other. So in that sense, China is actually lagging behind, I would say, many other countries um, when it comes to the unified tracking of the virus because of this lack of data sharing and because of all the incentives. Um, if you're a, an official in a small town in northeast China, then your incentive is to tr try and make sure that the officials higher up don't realize that there is uh, an increase in cases and just try to make sure you get it under wraps and before the higher, higher ups realize. I would also kind of zoom out a bit more from that, um, from that kind of uh, view of China at, at a very local level and, and ask, you know, at an, at an international level, to go back to the question that you frame um, this discussion around liberal capitalism versus authoritarian capitalism. The experience, the interaction that I have with foreign companies, particularly American companies in the tech sector in China, um, is that you know, the, their governments might be liberal democracies, but the companies themselves are capitalists in that uh, no matter what the latest human rights scandal is, or even, for example, human rights abuses in Xinjiang, which many foreign companies are implicated in the supply chains of, um, and maybe hire, hiring forced uh, Uyghur labor um, in their own factories, no matter what level of um, uh, human rights concerns, a lot of the times I think companies will make the decision, do I get more from profiting in this market or from leaving this market, even when they themselves are being um, affected by China's industrial policy or domestic preference policies. 
And so at the same time that you see um, Western uh, governments and, and you know, the citizens of such governments like, us, like ourselves worrying about the rise of an authoritarian China, the companies that are facilitating that rise uh, are making the cost benefit analysis that is still much, much better for them to stay in China than to leave. And for that reason, I think it's very difficult to consider um, those two systems, liberal capitalism and authoritarian capitalism, uh, fundamentally opposed. In a way, both systems are driven by the companies who decide where to invest and where to divest from. And right now, the answer is still, so far, China. And there's no democracy and accountability within those vast multinational companies, right? That they aren't they aren't operating operating on um, in, in, as themselves in their own entities as um, uh, democratic or accountable uh, entities. So that's really um, really helpful. Thank you, thank you for that. And I think we might come to you again. That's really insightful. Um, so the one thing I, that actually that you picked up though, which I wanted to take a bit uh, look at a bit further, is is that there's an intense amount of surveillance and which aids um, an in intense crackdown on, on um, human rights, um, civil liberties, etc., cetera, um, freedom of speech and expression. At the same time, the intense level of surveillance is not particularly effective at tracking and at addressing this current pandemic. Can you just say a little bit more about that? Because that, I think that's very interesting. It's, it's, um, it, <laughs> Outside of the uh, the questions about whether the Chinese numbers of, of deaths are, are are accurate or not, are not and one, one would suspect they're not, um, the idea that, that the model, which is very effective at cracking down and dissent, is actually not particularly effective at, at addressing this crisis. Can you say a bit more about that? Yes. Um, so there's a story that I was reporting a couple of weeks ago that I can also share uh, on this topic. So if you look at what kinds of objectives you need to meet in order to crack down on dissent, Often it's p affecting people who are being able to surveil and monitor people who are really in the minority of the population. The stakes uh, for being an activist in China are s so high. Um, at any point, you can mobilize you know, a dozen police officers in any, in any medium-sized city to monitor um, a human rights activist or a human rights lawyer, etc., who might be causing trouble. And you can really pinpoint the might of the surveillance system on, this one, on these few uh, people. In the con by contrast, the objective of trying to minimize or contain an epidemic is to have data on large numbers of people, millions, hundreds of millions of people, even in China, given that this was the Chinese New Year holiday, which is um, the largest mass migration in the world, and track where they're going, who they're coming into contact with, and also, most importantly, share that data across different regional borders. And it's the data sharing here that is a big issue because to be the governor of you know, a, south a southwestern province in China, you don't have any particular interest in sharing the data that you've fought hard to try and request from your local companies and telecoms providers and so on with the next province along. In fact, you might have completely uh, misaligned political objectives and even on a very kind of fundamental technical basis, you might have different kinds of data that you're interested in. And so this lack of alignment in terms of interest in sharing data um, and lack of coordination uh, from the top down to really make sure the bureaucrats at the bottom are sharing and formatting and data in the way that might be most helpful. I think that is what in the end leads to a, a lack of over, overview and uh, oversight on the epidemic. And there's a lot of evidence suggests that in fact, the central government is not aware of how much the outbreak is still posing a threat um, in small parts of China where there are some kind of recurrent um, cropping, cases cropping up. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, so one of the questions that was submitted ahead of time was um, why have not just governments but multilateral organizations like the EU and the UN failed so badly in leading on COVID? Um, and it's interesting because uh, that this makes this links to your point, Paul, about um, uh, China's vision of operating in a multi multilateral world. Um, uh, I just wanted to plug actually a series we've done on the crisis of multilateralism, uh, which Adam can put in the chat and as part of a series that Laurie curated on the crisis of multilateralism. Um, but it's interesting to hear that, yeah, so you've spoken about how the Chinese state response hasn't been as, as effective as, as you would assume, given um, the level of surveillance. Um, and, lot, and lots of others are asking questions about how other large um, supranational bodies like the EU and the UN um, have have failed have failed to address this this, this crisis have, have failed to rise to this crisis. Um, another question actually that's come up is, um, and there there are tons of fantastic questions being asked, but um, 
uh, what if, ne if liberal capitalism is not dying, but only a low consumption decade is coming, i.e. that the way that this crisis will shape and impact um, what's happening is not that necessarily we're going to re be replacing one model with another, but that we're just going to be living in quite a different economic reality for quite a long time. Um, Laurie, do you want to comment on that um, and also just comment on um, um, how you, you, you painted a very good picture at the beginning of, of, of the situation up till now, but how you, how you um, see COVID changing um, what, you've, what you've diagnosed and, and um, documented already in your piece. Yeah, sure. So um, a number of things there. I mean, I think fundamentally, uh, up until now or, or in recent decades, um, if you like, US, US power, US hegemony, I think has really been underpinned by around three, three things. One is raw military might, raw military power, and that's linked to, to technological dominance. The second one is around financial power and the role of the dollar in the, as the global reserve currency, which I, I kind of look at in a bit of detail in the piece. And the third one is around, I think, soft power and the shaping of the multilateral order, at least since World War II, around uh, US interests. And, you know, I think on, on some of these, uh, we are starting to see some of the things, you know, shift. Um, most obviously, I mean, you already mentioned, there's, the, there's just the reality, which is US has taken this America first turn um, you know, even from things like uh, the defunding of the WHO to things like um, the reports that it was kind of seizing ventilators headed for other countries and redirecting them to the US at the same time as China has been doing this, uh, you know, very intentional international charm offensive, um, you know, providing equipment to different countries, European countries, African countries, being much more, uh, you know, internationally minded and spirited, intentionally so, I think. But more significantly, um, I do think that the nature of the crisis does serve, I think, to sort of reinforce or, or, or slightly to the advantage of China's system, perhaps, um, but more importantly, highlight some of the serious shortcomings of the kind of uh, more free market liberal capitalism that we've seen in places like the UK and the US. Um, uh, and part of this is about the surveillance side of things. Um, you know, I, I think it's really interesting that we've seen uh, just in recent weeks in places like the US and the UK, much more discussion about uh, surveillance, the recognition that surveillance technologies, um, which of course have been very prevalent in our countries for a long time in one sense, but becoming much more frontline in our day-to-day -day lives with companies like Apple and Google working on, you know, embedding things in our apps, etc. And I do think we, we will probably perhaps see if surveillance become more accepted part of day-to-day -day life than we did before. Um, but also just in terms of economically, with governments playing a much more uh, interventionist role in our economies. We've already seen this uh, with, with governments, you know, subsidizing wages um, and, and various other things. We've had the, the International Monetary Fund, in many ways the kind of the, uh, the doyen of, 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 of neoliberal orthodoxy come out and say things, float ideas like establishing large state holding companies to buy up companies, which is obviously, you know, a vast departure from the type of model that we've seen before. And so I definitely don't think that we're about to see um, Western capitalism turn Chinese anytime soon, uh, if you like. But I do think we, we could certainly be moving to a world where some of the features of uh, you know, what I describe as authoritarian capitalism, whether it's the right term or not, but it is a different variant of capitalism than, than we have been used to. More intrusive surveillance, um, perhaps a crackdown on, 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 on democracy uh, and free speech. Um, and indeed a greater role for the state and the economy could become uh, much more prevalent and, and more of a new normal in the West than we've become accustomed to. And I think certainly on the bigger picture, that trend plays towards China's advantage. Interesting, that kind of less freedom, more welfare combination. Um, uh, Linda, you've just written a, a book about the historic evolution of capitalism. Um, so I'd love you to sort of respond to what Laurie said and sort of add your thoughts about, you know, at, in this COVID moment, what are what are the things that get accelerated or changed or shifted about about um, the future of capitalism in the West? Really, yeah, it's a small question, really. Um, that. Yeah, so, um, so I look at about two hundred fifty years of economic history, and there are periods in which the economic consensus breaks down, as in the system doesn't seem to be working. Now that has happened in the West, and that predates COVID nineteen. So I think what's happened with COVID nineteen is that it's probably going to accelerate um, some of the discontent with that, especially if you look at one of the main complaints about the economic system, the capitalist system, is that it is very it allows for a high degree of inequality. 
And now with the pandemic and the numbers of people who fall through the social safety net, who don't get enough support, who are really going to struggle, that has prompted a incredibly uh, broad spectrum of governments um, have, even the United States has begun to give a more generous social uh, safety net. And so to me, um, I think this is going to accelerate a trend which had already existed before the pandemic, which was just like we had in history um, after the banking crisis um, 10 years ago, that accelerated a dissatisfaction, a backlash against the current system. If you look back over history, and um, this also happened after the long depression of the 19th century, which is known as the Great Depression of the late 19th century. And that eventually led in the early 20th century to the creation of the welfare state and welfare state capitalism. But along the way, um, at one point, 40% of the world's population lived in either communist or socialist regimes in the early part of the 20th century. So people were looking for alternatives. And I think we're at such a point now um, today. Have been happening before, but I think people will be looking to see now. Hang on, if this works now in terms of having more a general, more generous social safety net, one-off universal basic income, which is now being tried, especially in developing countries, and um, checks have been sent in uh, the U.S., Hong Kong, Japan. I think all of this will make people think about um, reforming a different system, and some of them will reject it and go for a different system. They look to uh, the Chinese model, and we'll look to another model. But I think um, the jury is still out as to how any country has really dealt mm. with this pandemic. Mm. So mm. I think there are things we can learn, but I think we are still far from being able to assess if any of these models are going to do a good enough job, and we desperately need them to for, you know, for um, to be, yeah, for health reasons, um, as just the economy. Thank you very much, Linda. Yeah, I, I should just add a plug for a campaign. We're, we're headquartered in London and, and we're campaigning. We have a UK focused campaign um, which is calling on the government um, to catch everyone in the safety net. So um, it, here in the UK, the government has is, has is bailing out select groups of workers and, and companies and industries. And um, the effect of that is that the most vulnerable citizens in this country are being left behind. Um, uh, people who are unemployed or on benefits or um, and for other reasons fall through the safety net um, are being given virtually no economic assistance while other, other groups of the population are. So I would encourage, I'll ask Adam to add um, the link in the chat as well, but I'd encourage everyone to sign um, that petition, that, that campaign to ensure that the UK government actually does address the needs of, of, of everyone during this uh, pandemic. Um, moving on, um, Paul, you wrote a, a brilliant short series um, for us. I think it was last year um, with the, 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 the provocation or the question was, can ra radical social democracy save us? Um, and um, I just, again, I'm, I'm gonna ask you the similar question to what I asked uh, Laurie, Laurie and Linda here, but you know, how does, A, how does this crisis um, impact the evolution of, of, of capitalism? And reflecting back on that series you wrote for us about radical social democracy, um, yeah. What would you add to or change or, or uh, say differently now in the context of this? Well, look, um, the, the Western economies, I think, are going to be much harder hit than most people are understanding. It's, it's of course, it, it's a kind of quasi exogenous shock. It came from, it came from a, a market. It came from a virus. But it hits a very weakened economy, highly reliant on debt, highly undynamic. And so once the secondary of effects, you see, we had in a way that in 2008, the, the, lux, the luxury of knowing that the, the thing that caused it was the thing that fell over first, i.e. the finance system. Um, this time, the finance system will, is more resilient, but will eventually begin to fragment. And it, when that happens, I think we then get, uh, I think a prolonged, I think we're going to have a prolonged recession in, throughout the Western world in which deglobalization will, will, will speed up. It becomes more, more logical to onshore or nearshore production, including of food, which is the next thing we're going to start panicking about. So, so we see some deglobalization. But, but look, the big difference uh, that becomes more obvious between the two models we're discussing here, the kind of totally free marketized model and the, and the state capitalism that China's uh, chosen, 
is that um, if you think about what, what Britain's going through, there's one obvious difference. Of, of course, in Britain, we've got crony capitalism, the same as every region in China has a crony, semi-criminal, corrupt, nepotistic uh, relationship with the private sector, including our own companies. But what, what, is, what we obviously don't have is the ability for the state to take control of parts of the market. So what should obviously be happening now in Britain is that the Department of Health should take control of the medical goods sector and organise production. And the big lacuna in the British response is, of course, they've done a big fiscal stimulus, most of which is not being getting to the front line. Of course, they've done a big monetary stimulus. But they just don't have this reflex of being able to take over and control parts of the private sector. Um, now, the Chinese model does. That's the huge difference. And if you think about why, it's because the reason why Dominic Raab and, 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 and Boris Johnson can't take control of the even of their own NHS, which is utterly fragmented and privatized, let alone the medical goods supply sector, is that they are part of and beholding to a financially dominant elite. In, in other words, it's the, the finance sector is the Chinese Communist Party of the West. It, it, it decides what happens. And in China, even though the big, there is a big finance sector heavily interpenetrated with ours, it is still the CCP that takes those decisions. And as many commentators often know, the CCP is not just an elite party, that it has a conscious policy of recruiting slices of the population. So it will, of course, have agribusiness bosses, but it will also recruit peasants and farmers. And that is the, the source of its resilience. Now, I, as you know from my work, I'm not a fan of the CCP. But the point is that I, I think it at a certain point, she and the leadership in the 2020s, if we do go through a long uh, period of stagnation, they're going to have to decide several things. One is whether or not they can move out of the, effectively the, the upper middle income trap, that whether the country can actually come up with a developmental model that is no longer reliant on offshore, low, you know, low value production, uh, etc. And, and some of it, it absolutely relies on the, what Laurie writes about, the, tech, the technology dominance. Can they move to the next stage of that? Um, but, but also, the, as the deglobalization process gets underway, one's concern is that, and I know that British security planners are concerned about this, what they're concerned most about right now is fragile states. So China actually has the, probably the most fragile state on its doorstep in North Korea. And, and what, you, what I worry about, uh, you, you, Syria, Iran, and, and, and North Korea are the, what the British uh, security planners worry about. But in a way, it is a no-brainer. If, if North Korea were to collapse under the weight of economic plus epidemiological crisis, China would simply be able to absorb that shock. It's not, the, it's not true in, in, in Iraq, sorry, in Iran and Syria. And, and what you would then be wanting to see is whether or not China is prepared to step up and play a global role in stabilizing those unstable regions. Thank you. Yeah. And that's something that um, historically they've been quite reticent uh, to do. Um, uh, there's some fantastic questions and inputs and I, I, I can't get to all of them, but um, I'm going to try and touch on a few um, uh, just thoughts and uh, or, or questions um, to reflect on. Um, Someone wrote, is it right to isolate China's technological surveillance when the history of tech surveillance has actually been part of US domination, targeting its own population as well as abroad? And we touched on that a bit with um, the behavior of, of large tech firms, but I think it's worth reflecting on, on, on that really good point. Um, uh, someone else said, doesn't the term authoritarian capitalism unhelpfully conflate quite separate questions of one, the degree of state control of the economy, and two, the extent of personal and political rights and, and, li and liberties um, and reinforces a long-standing right-wing ideological project to treat attacks on quote free markets as attacks on democracy and I think that's also um, a really uh, interesting point as well you know that the Chinese model is is, is more economic safety net and and less um, freedom and, and liberty and that's not that doesn't have to be a package <laughs> right um and then another thoughtful question was what about other influential countries for example russia or strategic ones such as venezuela are they already taking a position regarding this new new cold war you know can can this positioning play an important role in the near future um for, for neoliberalism so I, it might be worth um 
us just thinking about a little bit about uh, very briefly other other countries and their positioning, uh, other influential countries and um, uh, poles of power and their positioning. And I'd, I'd, I'd put that to all of you to just anything that you pick up. Um, we've been focusing on China, but is there anything really interesting and significant that's happening um, in, ge in, in terms of geopolitical and economic power um, in the context of this moment that we should also be paying attention to? Paul, I might go for you first since you seem to be unmuted. Oh, sorry. Um, look, I, 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 in the light of the way Xi's leadership reacted to Trump, I think that has very much put Russia into a, into a second grade, sort of, it's in the second tier geopolitically now. It, Russia is, it, the Western security people increasingly see Russia that, as a proxy for China. I, it, it, it's an independent proxy, but, it, but it, it, it's, not a, it's not the same level of act, actor. I think also it's worth understanding that, that for the Americans, um, th this return to great power politics makes, makes the battleground really Europe. And no, you know, most of my reporting has, is done in and around Europe. And, and what you see is at, at every level almost that the Chinese soft power, which we all know about, you know, the, 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 the PPE masks to Serbia, buying up most of the, uh, the, the port facility and building a railway from Athens all the way up to, to Central Europe, um, the continuous courting of uh, Salvini in Italy. This is, the, this is just for starters, because if we see an 18 month slump and a, and a slow recovery, I would then expect what we haven't seen, apart from with Huawei, what we haven't seen is that Europe becoming a, a corporate battleground. A, a Huawei and, of course, uh, premiership football clubs. That's the two big uh, battlegrounds. But su suppose BA has to be nationalised or part nationalised. I think it's likely. Ditto with Virgin Atlantic. Um, it, when, those, when those companies come out of kind of state quarantine and they get refloated on the stock market, I would imagine that the first people in there would be uh, Chinese state-backed corporations to buy, you know, the airports, the airlines, the ports, uh, the railways uh, that don't survive this coming economic downturn. And I, I, it's a no-brainer from, from a Chinese soft power point of view that that is what you need to do. Um, so I think that it, this, the, the question Laurie poses is, is, is kind of, are we going to see an attractive model, you know, an authoritarian state-backed capitalism? No, because I think our own elites are absolutely wedded to libertarianism, authoritarian libertarianism, you know, Toby Young, Boris Johnson, uh, the, the, Lionel Shriver in The Spectator. That's what they're, you know, free market financialized, you know, uh, classic Western capitalism is what they want. And it, the Chinese model, in that sense, has very few takers, but, it, but Chinese influencers, influence will have a lot of takers because, you, I mean, just literally look at the, 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 the English premiership. It is, it is bit by bit just selling itself to China. And, and in other words, what, what, uh, what the, our FT correspondent said earlier is also true of Western country, companies here. They, they don't care about demo, democratic you know, uh, rep, reputation. Uh, when it comes to just getting access to ready cash and ready capital. So that's, my, that's where, where I think that goes. Thank you, Paul. And actually, Jan was going to come back on this. Um, you wanted to say a bit more on um, it, to follow up on Paul's point about political on economy and ownership. But yeah, do, do say more about that. Um, yes, Yuan here again. Um, I thought what Paul said about uh, the reasons why, for example, um, China can take over uh, um, certain parts of the economy, whereas in the UK, it's much more difficult for the government to, and that all being about the interests of finance is very, was very interesting because most of the time when we look at China, we don't do political economy analysis of China. But thinking on that point for a little bit, I think actually uh, I can only draw pretty dire conclusions because um, more than being an, even a capitalist state, China is a very pro-growth state. Mm -hmm. So you have all the same kinds of um, 
it's a very similar kinds of vested interests that you would in a, in a mature economy like the UK. House prices have to rise, they can't fall, they can at least stagnate, but they can't fall. Um, stock markets have to keep on booming, and if they don't keep on booming, then the government will literally rope in um, banks and investors to, to put in more, uh, put in more investment. Um, GDP growth has to go up, with obviously the very great exception of the current quarter that we're in. And all those kinds of elements of being a state that's very dependent on growth and locked into growth by also its own indebtedness um, is a feature that has suddenly evolved, like, in a quite stunning way, evolved in China, despite having set out more than 70 years ago to be a socialist state. And that makes me wonder whether, you know, if you are a government with an interest in keeping um, yourself in power and your main principle is that is the pursuit of power and you're willing to uh, you know, enrich your citizens to the extent that it helps you pursue that goal of power then you do default to this kind of in some ways very similar model um, of political economy that we see in the UK with some of the very similar kinds of ills. Thank you very much. Linda did you want to add any thoughts uh, to what's being discussed now and and uh, I guess in particular, there have been a number of other fascinating questions about can China assume a hege hegemonic role in the world with the language many people cannot understand or decipher, which I think is probably the answer to, to that is yes. <laughs> um, but um, I'd love to hear your reflection on, yeah, on, on, on both Jan and, and, and Paul's points and anything else you'd want to add at this point. Um, yeah, no, I think um, probably it's worth thinking about um, how the global economy is in terms of multipolar system with China and the US and all the tensions that we've seen, how it might sort of play out. And other countries do have a role. I've always thought the EU never quite made enough of the fact it's the world's biggest economic bloc. And obviously this pandemic, the summit today exposes the divisions within the EU itself. Um, so that's always been one of the reasons. But other countries, for instance, India has always been sort of more of a neutral player and a lot of the Asian countries want uh, to sell to China be, be aligned to the United States. So I think in terms of these, when I say multipolar, I, I'm not suggesting all the poles are equal, <laughs> mm. um, but poles have different amounts of weight. And I think what this implies, what this pandemic has done, is that it's going to make countries look more closely at these linkages. And there's very obvious points like the fact that um, supply chains are already becoming more localized. There's been a rebalancing of supply chains globally anyways. They have become much more uh, regional supply chains. But for environmental reasons, they've also become more localized. In other words, it takes a very polluting to fly things from around the world. And there's a lot of preferences for producing things locally, enabled by technology such as additive manufacturing. When you layer on top of that um, all the trade tensions, the geoeconomic risk that has made even just-in-time systems across borders subject to potential restrictions and tariffs, and I'm not just talking US and China, I'm now also talking Brexit. Um, there's also, um, you know, we, we've seen uh, companies in this lockdown change their supply chains to use their Brexit contingency measures to use local distributors and suppliers. So I think all of those things suggest that looking ahead, there will have to be a continued, um, I suppose, analysis by other countries um, as to how big an economic weight they currently are. Should they join together with others in the region like the ASEAN countries have done? They've created a free economic um, zone called the AEC. Um, you look at Africa doing that. But even if they do that, how they balance uh, the poles of US and China will become even more of an issue going forward because I think the supply chain issues have now been made so apparent during the pandemic. And there's always a statistic that I always think is extremely telling. Um, apparently over 90% of the pharmaceutical ingredients um, for the United States comes from China. And China supplies 45% of the world's PPE. And all of this, I think, is just going to raise questions about whether or not there needs to be more diversified supply chains, are there national security reasons to think about it? It's not to suggest autarky where nobody trades, but I think there will be a re-examination. And in fact, the European Commission's Trade Commissioner, Phil Hogan, um, has said today that um, that's exactly what the Europeans want to do. You want to maintain commercial open trade, 
but you want to think harder about supply chain security. And he and the competition commissioner will issue um, a policy, um, I think, next month around how the European community is going to view this going forward. And that's very much in line with what the Americans have done. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that. So I think um, that's, to me, um, where we're likely headed um, in the uh, in the 21st second decade of the 21st century my goodness what a century already <laughs> well indeed and the most significant event of the of the first decade happened on the very last day of the first decade which was when covid was officially recognized and announced which is extraordinary given the decade we just had and all the things that we thought were significant yeah the significant thing happened on december 31st Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so um, we were almost done here, but um, I just wanted to recognize that we've had people dialing in from all over the world, Bangladesh, Australia, Scotland, Mexico, Indonesia, Germany, Uganda, Vietnam, Peru, Greece, everywhere. Um, thank you all so, so much for dialing in and joining us. Um, uh, there's one more question which uh, someone's asked, which I thought might be nice to, as a sort of wrap up thought. And it's quite a difficult one because we've been talking about large um, issues of, about over which none of us have any personal influence or control. But someone asked, what are the everyday life choices that citizens can make to resist authoritarian capitalism? Um, and um, a lot of other people have asked about surveillance and what we should be most concerned about and what practices we should adopt. Um, similarly around uh, the environment and, and, and what a lot of this is going to mean um, uh, for, for climate change and for, and for the environment. So any last thoughts on anything that you as individuals or citizens can do to re resist authoritarian capitalism, assuming that it needs to be resisted, which is in a, some, a premise of this question. Um, I, I, I think Paul wants to go first, I don't mind. Oh, go on, Linda. Okay. Um, I think probably, uh, probably two things. I think now on, you know, on surveillance, there was, um, there's a simplification, and this is a simplification that was told to me by somebody who um, works in this area and policy. And the generalization is um, data in the United States is owned by companies, data in China is owned by the state, and data in Europe is owned by individuals. That clash of standards and approaches, I think, touches on some of the things that we are um, discussing. And to me, not having a global uh, agreement on it is going to be is going to be one of the reasons why it, this area is so challenging. Um, now, I think, you know, others will know better, but with COVID-19, contact tracing, I think that pretty much means you're surveyed in some way or another. Um, and I think that's going to open up a debate we ought to all have. Um, and in fact, that leads me to the what can we do? So I'm a strong believer in, um, in learning um, from history, not to become too pessimistic, because um, people who've come before us have come through a great deal. And when the consensus has broken down before, and what rebuilds it is everybody speaking their mind, looking at the evidence, um, you know, valuing uh, what they value in terms of freedom, in terms of um, you know, commerce, in terms of a lot of things. So in other words, you need to speak up, you need to become engaged, uh, you need to promote um, your values. And I think it's only through that process where you can cobble together a new consensus. I focus on the economics, but I think it would be very similar in other areas. And just to finish with an anecdote, um, when the welfare state was being debated and created, um, it wasn't just um, economists or academics who were writing about like, oh no, look, capitalism doesn't really seem to work. There's no social safety net. It was also others, you know, jumping in. There was a there was a, a woman um, called Helen Montague who used to write popular um, kind of tracks explaining economics as to why it is in the late Victorian era you needed to um, understand the benefits of the um, economic system, the capitalist system, but also where it needed to change. Apparently, she outsold Charles Dickens, so you know, you never know. <laughs> but anyways, get involved, get engaged, and, um, and that's the only way we're going to have that to change. Thank you, Linda. I'll go to you, Paul, just very briefly. Yeah, I mean, I, I, in the, I wrote a novel about my experiences in China, which um, basically isn't exactly a bestseller. But the, the, the theme of it was that one of the big problems with, with China is the absence of historical memory. Um, it's not only that they have a memory hole that they can, that, that the, 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 the state can, you know, can 
cancel information. But you know, we have those 70, 80 years of politics, which has never been recorded. You know, there are no memoirs, like, you know, sort of, you know, the Alan Clark memoirs, you know, there are no the FDR's biography. There's no, there, there is, there's no collective historical memory about what went on. And indeed, when, when, when authors, you know, and historians write, for example, the real history of the Great Leap Forward and the famine that took place, um, what happens is that, you know, they are, they're suppressed. So I think historical memory, a public historical memory, is one of the greatest, uh, the greatest bulwarks that we can have against um, uh, authoritarian, ultra authoritarianism. And indeed, what, one of the signs that someone is coming for a democracy and universal human rights is when they start to actually try to suppress the memory of things. Indeed, take back control. Um, <laughs> so we've got speak up, we've, 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 we've got learn history. Laurie, very briefly, just one, one thing that you would do and you would recommend other, other people do. Yeah, I mean, and this touches on another, another question which I saw co coming up in the comments, which is about, you know, is this about choosing between Western liberal capitalism or, on, on, you know, resisting authoritarian capitalism to defend that? And for me, it, it absolutely isn't about pitting one against the other. I think the position that we're in just now is neither of them have the answers that we need for the 21st century, certainly from someone coming from a progressive values perspective. Um, and it's not, you know, at this crisis obviously poses immediate challenges that we need to deal with. Um, but, you know, after this crisis, it's, it, you know, we can't go back to business as usual either in either of these systems because the scale, for example, of the environmental crisis is so enormous. And so I think the challenge for all of us is, is it's much bigger than just trying to resist authoritarian capitalism. It's about how do we create uh, an economic system uh, that serves both uh, people and planet and protects uh, democracy, civil liberties, et cetera. And that's an enormous, enormous challenge. And I don't think we're anywhere near there yet. And it's a huge uphill, uphill struggle. Um, but it's one that I think hopefully, uh, optimistically, uh, we, have to, we have to achieve. Because if we don't, I think uh, the, the, the future for, for humanity is, is, is rather bleak. Thank you, Laurie. One of the, I'm going to add one final idea, which is keep dialing into these discussions every week so we can keep figuring out how <laughs> um, we chart a way forward. Next week, we have a fantastic all-woman panel on justice during and after COVID-19. Um, three leading women, including Helena Kennedy, Latanya Mapp, and Monica Roa, who are leading the fight for justice and human rights across the world um, during the pandemic and long after. So please dial in for that. You can sign up to our newsletter, opendemocracy.net forward slash newsletter, if you want to hear about all our, or all our dial in discussions and see many of the articles um, uh, that, that have been referenced in, in this discussion. Finally, it's my job to say that if you did enjoy this panel, obviously we put these events on for free, but do consider making a donation, support.opendemocracy.net forward slash donate. Um, we aren't funded by dark money um, uh, and we don't have a billionaire proprietor and we do reliable, trustworthy public interest journalism. We hope you've enjoyed this and we hope you'll join us again and we hope you'll consider supporting us and keep reading and listening um, and viewing. Thank you all for joining us and thank you to our excellent panel. See you soon, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you.